Hey, I'm John Gordon with Positive University, and my guest is Scott Harrison. Scott is the author of Thirst and also the founder and CEO of Charity Water. Scott, you've, you've done so much, but I, I want to take it back to the beginning. Did you ever think that you would write a book like this, do the work that you're doing when you're a kid? And what did you want to be actually growing up? <laughs> growing up, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, well, you know, at first, obviously, the astronaut, the fireman, you know, all, all that stuff. But uh, my, my mom was really sick growing up. So when I was four, uh, there was this uh, terrible carbon monoxide gas leak in the house that we just moved into. And uh, my dad and I got a little sick but recovered, uh, but my mom never did. So her, her immune system was irreparably damaged uh, through this, this very toxic gas. And I grew up uh, taking care of her, you know, really in a caregiver role. And if you'd asked me back then, uh, I wanted to be a doctor to help sick, sick people like my mom get well. Uh, and, and grew up in a very conservative Christian family. I was uh, playing piano every Sunday in church, and I didn't smoke, and I didn't cuss, and I didn't drink. I played by all the rules. And then I completely lost the plot at 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> what happened at 18? Well, I moved to New York City as an act of rebellion and joined a band, grew my hair down to my shoulders, which was a terrible idea. Uh, the band immediately broke up because we all hated each other. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I learned that there was this job in New York City where you could get paid to drink alcohol for free. And I just couldn't believe it. It was called a nightclub promoter. And you, if you got the right people inside the right clubs, you could charge them uh, ungodly amounts. Uh, to, to purchase liquor. I and mean, people would pay $20 for a vodka Red Bull or uh, $500 for a bottle of champagne that only cost $30 to buy. So uh, this was my act of rebellion and it, it, it came along with smoking and drinking and gambling and cocaine and drugs and pornography addiction, all this, all really the darkness that you might uh, imagine would come with the underbelly of New York nightlife. But I worked at 40 different clubs over 10 years and on the outside, my life looked great. I was jumping in the back of cars with five models. I was flying around to Paris and Milan for Fashion Week. I drove a BMW. Uh, I had a grand piano in my New York apartment. I had a, an expensive watch. And uh, it looked good, but it actually wasn't. You know, it was a much different picture uh, kind of on the soul. Did you think you were happy at the time? At, at first, I did. You know, I was, I was happy in the rebellion. And, you know, I'd stopped going to church. I'd put faith and morality, you know, in a, in a very, very uh, far away corner and just explored, you know, living life, living big. Um, it really took its toll over time. And uh, at one point, half my body went numb, inexplicably. I mean, the, you smoke two packs of Marlboro Reds every day for <laughs> 10 years and, and do all the, the cocaine and, and, you know, it, it takes its toll on you. And I realized not only was I physically unhealthy. I was, I was emotionally unhealthy. I was spiritually unhealthy. I, I, was, I was bankrupt uh, morally, spiritually, uh, and, and also was just creating perhaps one of the most meaningless legacies a person could create. I mean, my life stood for nothing more than just getting people wasted every night. You know, the more, more people got drunk, the, the more money I made. And uh, it took me 10 years, sadly, to figure that out. So I was 28 years old and and, and had this assessment of my life, had the health scare, and uh, came back to, to rediscover a very lost faith, uh, a very lost uh, interest in, in living a virtuous life, I guess you could say, and asked myself the question, what would the exact 180 degree opposite of my life look like? What would, it, what would the 180 degree turn, not a pivot, not a little shift, you know, what did the walk in the other direction look like? Was there a moment where this happened? There were a couple. Um, there was a moment in, in South America in Punta del Este where I was on this unbelievable vacation with servants waiting on us in this compound in Uruguay. And I remember spending $1,000 at the fireworks store, just blowing them up on our backyard. And there were magnums of Dom Perignon champagne. It was just the very best. And it just dawned on me all over this week that there would just never be enough. Somebody would always have a, a more famous girlfriend, a, a plane, a better watch, a better car, more status, more fame. It was this endless pursuit of hedonism that would leave me forever unsatisfied. And that was really a moment. I mean, it was, uh, it was almost like the game of uh, musical chairs where the, 
you know, the, the music stops and I've got nowhere to sit for the first time. Wow. So, so unsettled. Yeah. I love that analogy. So then what, what, what shifted? How did you go about uh, moving from there to where you are now? Yeah. Well, six months later after this vacation, I, I make a pretty radical change and sell almost everything that I own. I liquidate my life effectively and apply to do one year of humanitarian service. That was my big idea, that I would go volunteer somewhere for one year as a kind of tithe or a you know, kind of penance for the 10 years that I'd selfishly lived. And I applied to all these famous humanitarian organizations, and then to my surprise, nobody will take me <laughs> because I'm a, I'm a club rat, and these are serious people doing serious work. So finally, uh, fortunately, one organization says, hey, if I paid them $500 a month, I could volunteer. And I had to go live in post-war Liberia, West Africa. I said, all right, I'm in. Here are my credit card details. This is, it doesn't get more opposite than this, going broke, <laughs> volunteering in the poorest country in the world. Wow. And so what was that like living there and, and, and serving there? Yeah, it was unbelievably challenging. I had never seen extreme poverty in my life before. So imagine being dropped into a country that had just ended a 14-year civil war led by children. Uh, it was a country with no electricity, a country with no running water or sewage system, a country where there was one doctor for every 50,000 people that lived there. So it was uh, hardship at the most suffering and the most extreme. And I was there with a group of humanitarian doctors and surgeons, medical experts who were effectively giving up their volunteer, they were volunteering their time for going their vacations so that they could help sick people in this country. They could, uh, they could perform surgeries, cataract surgeries, cleft lip and cleft palate surgeries, uh, help people who were lame uh, be able to walk again. And my job, again, that I was paying to do was uh, to be the volunteer photojournalist, was to document all of this work, was to take pictures and write stories of the transform transformative work these doctors were doing in the hopes that those stories and those photos would move people to give and make more surgeries possible. And I just loved it, John. I mean, I went from emailing the 15,000 people on my club list, uh, invitations to the Prada megastore opening in Soho, New York City, to, to pictures of leprosy, to pictures of, of surgeries happening, and then eventually to pictures of people drinking dirty water. So among all of the things that I saw over the year, which actually stretched into two years, um, I, I saw that people were drinking dirty, disgusting, contaminated water. The people of Liberia, 50% of the country was drinking from swamps, from brown, viscous rivers, uh, water we wouldn't set foot in, let alone let our animals drink. But this was what people were drinking. Uh, this is what children were drinking. And, you know, I realized that as I shared these images and these, these stories back with people in New York, some of them wanted to help. Some of them said, I, I didn't know that this suffering existed. How can I give money? How can I give time? How could I help end some of this suffering? And people began to send money to the organization I was working with and, and others began to volunteer time. Is that where you, the, where you conceived the idea for Charity Water? Yeah, yeah, I just couldn't believe that a guy like me for 10 years could run around selling bottled water for $10 to people who would buy it and not even open it. They wouldn't even drink it. And, and at the time, one billion human beings on planet Earth were drinking brown, disgusting water. A billion people worldwide didn't have access to the most basic need for health. So I guess, you know, coming back to that childhood vision, what better way to play doctor than to provide the world with the most basic health need, clean water? Uh, later learned that the dirty water is responsible for half of uh, dirty water and lack of sanitation responsible for half of the disease throughout the developing world. Half the sick people in all these countries where we were working didn't need to be sick if they had this basic need. So, yeah, I, I would say I came back at 30 years old broke because <laughs> I'd given all my money to them. But, but really with the life's mission of bringing the planet clean drinking water. So how did you then get started and start this initiative, which obviously is a huge undertaking, a, a big mission, a, a big idea. How do you get started with that? And I know you talk more about it in the book and yeah. 
Well, let's, before we get there, why did, why did let's you- show, Let's show the real one. You got that. You have like the advanced super secret galley. Yeah. So it looks, uh, this is the, like the hardcover. We just brought it out. Um, it's a few weeks old. Uh, you know, it's got a, a ton of photos in, in the insert of, of some of these things. Show some of the photos. Show some of the photos. Yeah, well, you know, okay, I talk about, um, you know, dirty water. You know, this is a child that I met in, um, in, uh, in Kenya, and she was drinking from the Molo River, and every time she would drink this, she would vomit on her shirt. Oh, wow. And she would throw up on herself. She, she was sick, like, in real time from the water. Um, you know, here's a picture of, uh, I guess, the after. You know, often we're able to bring drilling rigs into these villages and, and drill water. That's clean water shooting up from about 200 feet underneath the ground at a school where over a thousand students were attending and, and had no clean water to drink. So, yeah, I wrote this uh, after t 10 years of charity water. Um, uh, we were fortunate to be, it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list, and it's, it's, it's had um, just, just amazing response. People have been very, very kind. But I really wanted to share you know, both my personal story of finding my way out of the darkness, I guess you could say. Um, I, I've met so many people uh, over the years who feel stuck. You know, they feel like their past defines their future or, or maybe their past mistakes prevent them from living a greater future. And, you know, I, I get pretty honest in the book. It talks about some, some really dark stuff. I mean, it opens with me talking about... Um, you know, some, some overdoses and, and some, you know, there's drugs, there's guns, there's, there's a lot of stuff you might not expect in a charity book. <laughs> but, but then I, you know, I actually wanted the project to help people get clean water. So I donated the whole book advance and all the proceeds to charity water. So um, just hopefully that it becomes a vehicle to get people excited about this movement that's been growing. And I think, you know, uh, something about turning 40, running the organization for 10 years, raising over a quarter of a billion dollars, having children myself, you know, it felt like a, a time to pause and reflect and see if anything that I learned, you know, building Charity Water, you know, going through this personal experience could be helpful for others uh, as they build their startups, as they build their social ventures, or maybe just as they, as they look for more purpose in their lives. Yeah, a question on that. Charity Water is very mission driven. How would a regular organization that doesn't necessarily have you know, a big vision or a big mission, be able to apply what they learn from you and take that to their company if they're not, say, a nonprofit? Yeah, you know, I talk a lot about giving in the book and, and, you know, in fact, rail against the idea of giving back. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's people listening or watching that uh, you've heard this, right? Our company's giving back. I, I think this is unhelpful language. Uh, it makes it sound like giving is an obligation. It's out of debt or out of shame. You know, we, we pillaged and plundered. We've taken so much and we've gotten so fat. And finally, we should throw a few scraps back to the less fortunate. So, you know, we, we've really tried to build a completely different culture of radical generosity. Uh, we have tried to make giving a joyful experience where uh, we just, so we say drop back. Never say giving back again. Um, build a culture of giving. Giving your time, giving your talent or, or the thing maybe that your company makes, giving your money, both personally and corporately, if you're able to, uh, to end the suffering that you see around you, uh, maybe both on a local level, in your local community, on an international level. And, you know, there's a lot of the things that we've learned there about, about really building this global movement of generosity. You know, now, um, as we're recording this, over about one million people from 100 countries have joined Charity Water, you know, given now over a third of a billion dollars, so 330 some million dollars um, to allow us to impact, uh, at the end of this year, it'll be 10 million people with clean water. So 10 million human beings going from drinking dirty, disgusting water to, you know, to clean water and having their lives transformed in the process. So yeah, I wanted to share some of the stories. I mean, there are stories in the book that'll, that'll make people cry. Um, and, and I think hopefully, you know, laugh and, and, and say, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like we could do this, you know, hopefully it would inspire people to, to say, you know, I, I want to either join this cause or find something this purposeful and add that into my life or my business. I think it's amazing that you donated everything, your advance, your royalties to charity. Well, that's easy. I mean, I'm running, I'm running an organization for, for 12 years now where a hundred percent of all donations have always gone directly to the water project. So uh, if, if people aren't familiar with Charity Water, uh, we said, okay, the mission is very clear. Uh, we want the number of people on earth that drink dirty water to be zero. <laughs> right? We want every single human being alive to have access to the most basic need for life. 
Um, but the vision actually became larger. It was to reinvent charity. It was to reimagine the charitable experience that so many people had become cynical and skeptical towards. Um, you know, they're, they're interesting. I don't know your viewership as, as your listenership is specifically, but if you were just taking America, 42% of Americans don't trust charities. The USA Today polled them. 70% of Americans told NYU during a study, 70% of people said they believe charities wasted their money. Mm. So what we've done very differently now for 12 years is uh, every penny we ever raise from the public goes directly to fund these clean water projects. We then prove all of them on Google Earth and Google Maps. So we show people the satellite images of the wells. I know your family did uh, a few years ago. I could type right now your John Gordon or John Gordon family and actually look at a satellite image of those wells when they're built. Um, some of the wells now even have sensors on them. So we could see yesterday how much clean water the well you funded years ago actually pumps. So we've tried to build this innovative, uh, inspirational, hyper-transparent charity that just wasn't anything that we saw out there. I mean, we, we didn't see the big orgs doing this. We saw a lot of big orgs asking people for money, sending them a tax receipt, and they're just asking for more money on repeat. So we've tried to show people their impact in the hope that it, um, you know, that it would, uh, it would inspire them to, to continue to be generous. So you raise all this money to provide people with clean drinking water, and yet you have all this infrastructure that you have to support as well. How do you pay for the infrastructure, the employees? Yep. Do what they do? Very hard. Um, but there are, uh, we, we've developed an amazing group of 131 families. Uh, we call that The Well. And uh, they give on three-year terms. It's a, it's a pretty significant commitment. They give um, at least $60,000 a year. And all of that supports our 80 full-time staff in New York, the offices, the flights, the Epson copy machine, the phone bills. So those 131 families have made it possible for the million people to give in the purest way. Um, and it's an amazing group. I mean, it is the founders of Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, WordPress, Pandora, you know, senior executives at Apple, um, Depeche Mode pays for our overhead. I mean, it's, it's this, this really cool assortment of friends who've said, we get it. Um, we realize these costs are unsexy, but we'll help you pay your team. We'll help you build the organization so that uh, the, the, the disenchanted, disenfranchised people um, will have a, a reason to give. So we've really made this work now. I admire your leadership so much and, and how you, you made it work all these years. When you were first getting started, give us an idea over the years, just a few obstacles you had to overcome and, yeah. and how you created Charity Water to be what it is today. Yeah, well, you know, just back on the, uh, the overhead, uh, early on, you know, about a year and a half, two years in, we, we'd raised a couple million dollars. The 100% model was working. We, people were actually telling us, John, that this was the first charitable gift they had made in their life because they knew where every penny would go and they believed in water as a cause and they could then see the impact of those dollars. So, uh, you know, that was going really well, but, but we, were, we were really struggling to make payroll on the other side. And we had this moment, really this moment of uh, a crossroads for the organization where we had only a few weeks left in the overhead bank account, but we had nine months of cash that we couldn't touch, uh, $900,000 in the other accounts. And it was interesting, the advice I was getting at the time was, oh, go borrow. Like, you got 900 grand, like that's, you know, that's nine months. Like, you gotta pay your people and make payroll, just write an IOU, you'll pay that back later. Money's fungible, right? All these arguments. And, you know, I was so outraged by that idea. I mean, if we borrowed one penny from the public's money, we would betray their trust. There'd be a crack in the foundation. We would compromise our integrity forever. Uh, we should just give up. We should go home. And, you know, uh, I was going to shut the organization down and just cry business model failure and say, hey, this 100% thing just didn't work. Rather than, it, you know, than, than take the public's money and do something that we, we told them we wouldn't do. And, uh, you know, I remember I was praying at this, this moment with very little faith, if I'm honest. And, you know, whether you believe it or not, uh, a, a complete stranger walked in the office, sat with me for two hours and wrote a million dollar check into the wow. office. A successful entrepreneur had just exited his company through an acquisition AOL, um, was looking for something to get involved in and said, I can pay for a year of charity water. Love your idea. You need more time to work this out. 
So that was really family one of now 131 families that show up for us in that way. Amazing. But so it could have is- had a different outcome, and at least I would have had my integrity. We wouldn't be <laughs> having this conversation talking about charity water, but, you know, I wouldn't have lied. Yeah, how important is integrity? Yeah, I mean, it, it, if your stated mission is to win back uh, distrustful people, uh, it's pretty important. <laughs> so, you know, I would say that's, that's my personal core value. I mean, I think much more important than what you would ever do is the way that you do things. And, you know, I would, I would forfeit growth uh, to just to do things the right way. Um, and then there have been many, many organizations. There, there's other times that I write about in the book where we, we were tempted maybe to compromise our integrity or cut corners and have always just tried to do things the, the hard way and the right way. And, and I, almost all the time they, they pay off. You know, you never regret that. I love it. This is Positive University. So how did you stay positive through all these challenges? You said even your faith was tested many times. Yeah. I don't know. I think um, I I default slightly to optimism. And, (laughs) you know, I've I've had the, I don't know, gosh, any, any, if there are any founders listening or any, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, look, if I'm honest, you know, we, the experience has teetered between such an abundance mentality. Oh my gosh, we should be raising billions. Everybody on earth should be giving to clean water. And then the scarcity mentality, we've raised our last dollar. Like it's over, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of up and down and up and down and up and down. And um, I think uh, we work really hard, you know, enough people say yes, where you latch onto the yes and you, you, you put the nose aside and, and you, you find these things to just keep encouraging yourself over the years. And, you know, now 12 years later, I mean, you know, this year, today, just today, we're going to get 4,100 new people clean water. And we're going to do that again tomorrow. Today. We're do it again the next, today, every day of the year, 4,100 people. We're going to get one and a half million new people clean water this year. Um, so that's, you know, I live in New York City. That's Madison Square Garden every four and a half days. You know, our biggest arena in Manhattan, like a sellout U2 show, like we're doing that every four and a half days. So that, that's encouraging. You know, we try and encourage ourselves. Um, what can be a little daunting is Charity Water's 10 million at the end of this year in the face of the global problem, 660 million, 166 of the work that needs to be done. So we got to go faster. We have to invite more people into this movement. You know, we, we want to help more people. You know, there are thousands of kids dying right now of bad water because we have not gotten to them yet. But we know how to solve their problem. We actually know how to give them clean water, but we haven't raised the money yet. We haven't uh, built uh, the movement up enough yet to save those kids who are dying today. So that really keeps us going. Is that what drives you every day? Yeah, it really does. I mean, gosh, I mean, I've been to 69 countries now. So I've seen a lot of of, uh, both joy and suffering around the world. I've been to Ethiopia 30 separate times. And boy, when you live in a village uh, where, you know, a little girl hung herself because she spilled her water after an eight hour walk, uh, it, it motivates you to, to do more. Um, when you travel in a village, when a woman tells you that she feels beautiful for the first time in her life, because she finally has enough water to wash her face and her body and keep her clothes clean, you know, that drives you. So I've really been um, fortunate to have so many of these life experiences connected directly with the work, being in hundreds of villages without water, uh, hundreds of villages with clean water and see the difference that, that our work here every day makes, that our ambassadorship or our ad- advocacy um, really makes, that, uh, that, that keeps me going. That's the fuel. It, it blows my mind to think you've been doing this so long, you've been solving so many problems and yet you're only 166th of the way there and there's still so much to be done. In that regard, then people can get involved Let's yeah. talk about, let's talk about uh, the birthday thing. I, a number of years yeah. ago, not too long ago, actually, I, I donated my birthday. I think we raised over $40,000 for amazing. my birthday, which was great. Where, where did that idea start and can people still do that? Yeah, they can. So uh, it started with, well, day one was my 31st birthday party. So Charity Water started around my birthday and I said, look, I'm turning 31. Let me throw a party in a nightclub to kick this thing off because I can get the nightclub for free. I can get the booze done and give everybody open bar and on their way in, let's just have them all um, donate $20 and promise that hundred percent of that money would help people in, in Northern Uganda. So that initial night we raised $15,000 and we immediately send every penny 
to Northern Uganda. We did our first projects and then we sent the photos and the GPS coordinates of those projects back to the 700 people that came to the party. And we said, look, you did this. Here's where your money actually went. Here's clean water flowing, video, photos, uh, satellite images of the wells. And, and we just found people were blown away. They'd never expected to hear from the charity again. And they could see the, the proof of where their 20 bucks went. So a year later, I said, I don't want to throw another party in a nightclub. And it doesn't really scale. I don't need a party. I don't need any gifts anyway. What if I donated my birthday for clean water? I said, well, I'm turning 32. What if I just asked everyone for 32 bucks? At $32 for my 32nd birthday. I had a nice ring to it. And, uh, you know, I just started emailing everybody I know, just like you did, and said, hey, I'm, I've been blessed. I got clean water my whole life. People don't. Um, would you consider donating $32 if you could afford it or, or more if you could for my 32nd birthday? And I make a promise that 100% will go there and I'll show you the impact. And to my surprise, you know, I raised almost $59,000 as this idea just spread. And then a seven-year-old kid in Texas starts knocking on doors in Austin and he starts asking for $7 donations and he raises 20 grand. And then an 89-year-old down in Florida donates her 89th birthday and says, look, I'm turning 89. I've lived a great life. Uh, I've always had clean water. I'd like other people to have the shot at, at reaching 89 years, you know, through, through this, 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 this basic need. And uh, this movement just started to grow and grow. And now, gosh, people have... Uh, the birthdays and the fundraising campaigns have helped over 2 million people get access to clean water. So it, it's a great thing uh, to do. Uh, people can go to mycharitywater.org. And uh, people love getting you stuff. They don't want to get you an Amazon gift card or a tie or a handbag or, you know, a wallet or socks. I mean, you know, they would much rather, uh, I think, support something redemptive and, and life-changing you know, which is really a celebration of you. And, and you know, people are happy to give. They loved celebrating John Gordon's life, their friendship with you, um, which then provided life uh, for, for more than four communities around the world, which is amazing. I have to tell you a funny story. My daughter, when she graduated high school, that's when we, we did the well for her. It was $10,000 for the well. So she was graduating high school, going to college. And I said, hey, here's your high school graduation present. She wanted the car. She yeah. wanted the car. And uh, so I showed up with this paper that gave her a well. And she's like, what? Like, like she was very entitled at the time. And I was like, I knew I needed to break that sense of entitlement. She's going to get a well. I said, you're going to donate your, your birthday, your, well, your opportunity to go to college to, to, to bring in people clean water. So now we laugh about that all the time about, Hey dad, remember when I graduated high school and you got me a well and she though knows how meaningful it is. And it's something we talk about and she'll never forget it. So you graduated. Well, she graduated high school. Now she's a junior in college. So maybe when uh, she graduates college, you take her to see the well as a gift. That is a great idea. We are definitely going to do that. And we and probably then you can have a big I told you so moment in the village, right? <laughs> that, that will be amazing. Dads are always looking for that. Would you rather have a car or these 250 people whose lives you changed uh, for the last eight years? <laughs> exactly. Let's, let's make a difference in people's lives. Let's impact people instead of just re receiving and taking. Let's give. And that's why I love what you do. And uh, I want to just uh, uh, thank you so two much. Other, for sharing. Two other quick ways. I mean, you know, obviously they could buy the book. Thirst helps people get clean water. And then there's this new community we just started building because um, not everyone is willing to ask people for money that we, we realize this is a group of people that are like I'm terrified I could never even imagine doing that even if it's not for me and uh, we really started building uh, kind of the Netflix of clean water or the, the Spotify of clean water a, uh, a monthly community of people who are showing up with what they can give every month uh, in the same way that they're showing up for HBO or Cinemax or Netflix or Dropbox or you know the, the New York Times and that has been uh, allowing us to help so many people. So there are now uh, people from 100 countries that are giving an average of about 30 bucks every month, which is what it costs us to get one person clean water. And uh, boy, that's, been, that's just been exploding and allowing us to help so many people. Um, just that community alone will help 350,000 people get clean water. So, so, uh, so $30 helps spring. Them. Yeah, $30 helps one, one, one person. One well, person. There's a lot of people that could give a dollar a day. And look, we've got small businesses that are given, you know, 300 a month on their, on their corporate annex. And we have college kids who are given 10 bucks. We have, uh, we have seven years.
connection. So it's really an amazing community. And that's called The Spring uh, at Charity Water. People can just Google The Spring Charity Water. Now let's back up. Let's back up. We just froze for about a second. So let's back up again. Yeah, sorry. So I was saying that that community is called The Spring. Uh, so people could just Google The Spring at Charity Water. So what are you excited about going forward? It's been a time of really exciting growth. So the organization grew 40% last year. You know, I think... Um, and, and is up another 40% this year. So it really feels like we're, we're starting to tip. I think I would attribute that to two things. One, just showing up for 12 years. You know, when you show up for 12 years, good things happen. You know, that kind of long obedience in the same direction. And, uh, and, and I think too, you know, it's been a pretty toxic uh, time in our country. You know, certainly politically, people are fighting about everything it seems. There's, there's the highest level perhaps of disagreement, you know, that I've ever experienced and anger and animosity. And the beauty about water is that everybody can agree to agree, right? So we have, uh, you know, right-wing Republicans, we have left-wing Democrats, we have independents, we have Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, Mormons, like everybody can stand for clean water. And I think, you know, in some ways, people have been flocking to this saying, um, we can be good neighbors, we can, you know, reach out our arms across an ocean, we can end some of the senseless suffering uh, and come together and agree on generosity, agree on clean water. We can put some of our differences aside. So it's been fun to build a community with people who I know would violently disagree politically, um, you know, come from very different religious points of view or, or none, but come together under this, uh, this really kind of, you know, banner of, of giving and clean water. So I'm excited to see that, that movement really continue. And um, again, you know, 166 is not enough. You know, we want that to be, uh, and, and there's a lot of other great orgs that are working and, you know, we're a part of a, of a community of people that are, that are really dead set on ending this. And I want to see it done in my lifetime. I don't want my kids to have a guy like me, you know, come into their high school or college and show them pictures of, of other kids dying because of bad water. Is it possible? It is. It's absolutely possible. It's, there are a lot of problems we don't know how to solve in this country but, or, or, or in the world. Um, there are possible vaccines that we may or may not discover, uh, cures for diseases. Um, you know, we don't know how to cure cancer. You know, uh, maybe we, we discover some of those cures in the future. But uh, water's not like that. We know how to give every human being alive today clean water. Not a single person where, you know, you and I would scratch our heads and say, oh, we just couldn't get them water. Like, we just know how to do it. Definitively, uh, no one size fits all solution there. There we've now employed 14 different technologies across 26 countries, a lot of different things work in a lot of different environments and contexts, but we know how to do it. We haven't created the awareness. We haven't created the will to do it. Haven't created the resources yet to do it, but we actually know how to do it. And it, it's great working on a solvable problem every day. Yeah, we often hear people talk about leaving a legacy and you're leaving an amazing legacy when you think of the legacy you want to leave for your children, for this world, how would you describe that? Well, I think, you know, I want them to, to believe that, you know, dad lived his life, um, you know, as a faithful kind of servant, um, both to, to God, both to the poor, you know, was a great husband, was a great father. So I think I put all that stuff actually above work. Um, and then, you know, crushed it. Uh, you know, and, and we, we gave, I don't know, 100 million people clean water, 200 million people clean water, like worked a, a long time and, and really stayed the course and, and made a huge impact, both inspiring people to be generous and to, to find redemption as they, you know, maybe move from selfishness to, to a concern for others through giving, you know, moving money that's latent in bank accounts. It's helping no one and actually allocating that to end suffering in the here and now. You know, if I, can, if I can move people in that direction and then actually be the best steward of that money and get as many people clean water. Well, I'm inspired to give more again this year and to continue that. And I hope the people watching, listening are, are inspired as well because I don't think there's anything more important to, to give people the foundation of life. And what is that? It is water, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Water is life. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I know that and have heard that in different languages. You know, water is life. Tsuri mai khunzeti in northern Ethiopia. Like, it is a, it's the most basic need we have as humans. So this book, or your version, the hardback, is, is, uh, has been out for, for a little while now. 
obviously five, five weeks. So it's, 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 it's new and it's still exciting. I just finished an 18 city book tour, which was exhausting. I know you've been on a few of those. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a little tired, but you have so much energy for this mission. It, it's, it's so clear. Uh, are you continuing to share the book? Are you continue to, to read in different places? Do you, you talk to schools? How does that all work? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'll, I'll get to um, next year, go and talk to, you know, a lot of the, the buyers, you know, who are assigning the reading for, for kids. I think it's a great tool for students. You know, I wish I'd read a book like this. Um, I might not have become a nightclub promoter. You know, I didn't think that you could, you could live an interesting life and, and serve others. You know, I guess I would have put that in, the, um, in a different category. You know, I don't think there was social entrepreneurship back then, you know, in the same way that it is now. So, yeah, I'm still really excited about it. I mean, we're hearing stories of, of the book moving people and, um, and people responding sometimes in really uh, surprisingly generous ways. So um, it's a great way people can help and, and get a little more of the story. And people will be watching this before Christmas, so I think it's, an, it's a really great Christmas gift, and it's also a great opportunity to give during the holidays. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we do see that, uh, that holiday. It's crazy, right? The end of the year and January 1 are very different. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people give before the end of the year, right? Yeah, well, a lot of people give. Yeah, there's a rush before midnight on 1231, you know, for, for tax incentives and stuff. And that's actually why the spring has been so valuable to the organization, you know, creating a group of people who just show up every month and say, look, as long as you guys give away 100%, as long as you're committed to transparency and, and making sure um, our money's making an impact, like we'll show up for you in the same way, you know, we're showing up for Netflix, you know, who's delivering us free movies um, or, or, or we're showing up for a music content. So that's been really exciting. I'm really excited about that community too. We've got 30,000 people in the spring. Um, and Netflix has 130 million. I think Spotify has 95 or 100 million. So I think there's, there are a lot of people who could do that. Um, I think we're just at the very, very beginning of that journey. And, and I, I'd, I'd love to build that community to a million and beyond. Do you feel like you were born to do this? <laughs> um, I love telling stories. I think, you know, I was, I was born to, you know, tell stories. I guess I, I told the wrong stories for 10 years, get past the velvet rope, spend $5,000 on booze and your life has meaning. Um, so it's, it's much, uh, much better encouraging people to, uh, to give wells, I guess, <laughs> than, than, than by Cristal. Well, thank you for making a difference in this world, Scott. You're one of my heroes, and I know that you're a hero to many. Uh, one final thought, who's your, who's your hero? Yeah, there's, there's a guy I really admire uh, who I met on the Mercy Ship. I write about him a lot. I'll actually show you a picture of him. Um, a guy named Dr. Gary Parker. And uh, he was a surgeon from California. You know, said, oh, I think I can take three months off. Um, I'll show you a picture of him. This guy with the hat on. Yep. And uh, so it took three months off and uh, said, look, maybe I can, you know, use my hands and I can operate on people who, who couldn't afford surgery uh, or who live in a country where there is no surgeon available. And, uh, well, now he's been there 35 years. <laughs> wow. So he never went back to his practice in California. He just, he, he stayed on the ship, got married, raised his kids. Uh, hopefully his kids are going to come and intern with us, you know, as they're all grown now. And yeah, I mean, I think that three and a half decades, you know, if I was still doing this 35 years from now, I'd, I'd be pretty excited. Thanks, Scott. God bless you. God bless Charity. Thanks for having me. God bless. God bless.